أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم أفتع علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله عبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين وأما بعد فقد قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم حب الدنيا رأس كل خطية. Brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته. أعظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم. I begin by giving my condolences to the Imam of the time. To all of the respected maraje, to our scholars, to our elders, and to all of you, respected brothers and sisters, on the anniversary of the sacrifice of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that for the sake of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, that He allows us to take full advantage of this important night. We are here on the eve of Ashura. And for so many nights here, we keep hearing before I get up here, an announcement. And the announcement is, everyone please take a step forward. You know, once a scholar was in a gathering like this, and that announcement was made, and the scholar got off the member and he was walking out. And they said to him, where are you going? And he said, my job is done. All I came here tonight to do was to remind us, remind myself, remind you all that we need to take a step forward. Brothers and sisters, this is what we have the opportunity for tonight, for tomorrow is to take that step forward. Is to make ourselves worthy of this caravan of love, this caravan of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. The ship that we said is wider, it can carry more of us to the promised land, to that prox proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to heaven, and it can take us there faster. This is the opportunity that's in front of us. And because of what we've seen in Islamic history from the time of Rasulullah to the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen to the time of Abu Abdullah to this day, we've decided to focus these few nights on the topic of the fall of the elite. This idea that it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. There's always that danger for each, of any, each and every one of our futures. Alhamdulillah, you're here today. But what we're trying to ensure is that we're not just here today, but we're here tomorrow, and we're here when the Imam of the time comes, and we're here with Abu Abdullah al-Hussein on our deathbeds. This is what we're trying to ensure in these nights. To give ourselves the tools to make sure that when we come across our tests that are coming our way, that we have the capacity to pass those tests. So what we've done so far, if you recall, is we've gone through the Battle of Jamal, we've gone through the Battle of Safin. Yesterday, we went through the fall in the Qur'an, and yesterday we started with the fall of the elite in Karbala. We discussed three individuals, leaving off with Ibn Ziyad. 
Tonight, brothers and sisters, we are going to talk about two more individuals. And just like was the case with Ibn Ziyad, we can feel a little bit more confident with their ending. Why? Because their names are also mentioned in the ziyara that we just recited, the ziyara of Ashura. And just uh, to mention a point about this ziyara of Ashura, really give, us, give attention to this ziyara if you haven't already done so. You can't find someone in the holy cities who has made significant spiritual progress except that they are closely connected to this ziyara. It's one of the keys. So give special attention, especially there's a lot of emphasis on reciting it between Ashura tomorrow and Arba'in. So if you're able to do that, then alhamdulillah, or if not, whenever you can, inshallah, even if it's just the English. So the first individual, brothers and sisters, that we're going to discuss tonight is Umar ibn Sa'd. And we're going to do it by doing what? Looking at three things. Who he was, what he did, and why he fell. If you send me a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So we've already gotten a head start. Because we have a little bit of an idea of who he was. Because if you recall on... I believe our third gathering, we discussed Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, his father. Just to refresh your memory, we said there that Sa'ad was someone who was close to Amir al-Mu'mineen. He was someone who was in the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He was someone who was one of the first Muslims. He was someone who proved himself on the battlefield, who proved himself with his scholarship. And we said that over time, we saw that because according to some, Amir al-Mu'maneen himself mentions in Nasr al hatred, or some of the ulama, they say jealousy. Over time, we see that Sa'ad ended up making that crucial decision when it came to the shura for selecting the third khalif. And we've went through all that history. And we talked about how Sa'ad tried to embarrass Imam Ali when he said, ask me before you lose me. And that's when Imam Ali foretold that his son would be the killer of Abu Abdullah al-Hussein. So this was Sa'ad. Umar ibn Sa'ad, what do we know about him? According to some of the historians, we see that he was a contemporary of Imam Hussein. Some even say that he was a, a playmate of Imam Hussein growing up. And like we've seen with all of the individuals, you don't just show up in the battle of Karbala on the side of Yazid. It doesn't just happen overnight. Okay? One of the key issues that came up that Umar ibn Sa'd was involved in was the issue of Hujr ibn Adi. He was one of the companions of the Holy Prophet, and they were basically, there was some false testimony made against him. And because of that false testimony, Muawiyah put him to death. And one of those individuals who is recorded as having given false testimony was Umar ibn Sa'ad. Now, brothers and sisters, when we move ahead towards these nights, towards Ashura, what was the role that Umar ibn Sa'ad was playing? Okay. We see that right when Imam Hussein salam left Medina, when Yazid came to power and Imam Hussein left Medina for Mecca, when he reaches Mecca, there's a huge welcoming. The people are excited. They say, Alhamdulillah, Imam Hussein, say they, show, say they Shabab Ahl Jannah, one of the masters of the youth of paradise, he's here in Mecca. They were excited. They were thinking about revolution. How can you see Hussein and not think of revolution, whether it's then or whether it's today? We see that, according to some, Umar ibn Sa'd, he was in Mecca as well. And he had a government post there. And when he realized the type of response that Imam Hussein was getting, he wrote to Yazid to say, hey, just to give you a heads up, this is what's going on over here. 
And this type of conduct didn't stop there. We see that when it came to Kufa, and when Muslim reaches Kufa, who is it that gives Yazid the heads up again? It says, hey, you better change your governor. You better some, send someone who can handle this situation here. And that's when Ibn Ziyad comes into the picture. The Ibn Ziyad that we spoke about yesterday. See, so Umar ibn Sa'd had a critical role. Again, when it was, moving on in the story, we see that when Muslim, we see he was alone there. Everybody had left him. And he's in front of Ibn Ziyad, and he knows that the end is near. And this gives you a little bit of insight into Umar ibn Sa'd, and why he comes into the category of fall of the elite. When Muslim is looking around the room, and they say, do you have anybody you want to, you know, say your will to, or give your last statements to? You know, who do you want your house to go to? Who do you want, you know, do you have any message for your son, or whatever the case may be? Who is it that Muslim sees in the room that he says, let me tell you? It was none other than Umar ibn Sa'd. He says, you have a relation to us. You have a long-standing relation to us. Both from a family perspective and from a relationship perspective. So I'm going to tell you what my last statement is. What my last will is. And we said that there he said to get the message to Abu Abdullah al-Hussein not to come. And here there's differences of opinion amongst the historians. Some say that Umar ibn Sa'd said like, no, I'm never going to tell. He's, he didn't even tell Ibn Ziyad that this is what it was. And some say that he mentioned that this is what the will was, that what Muslim had wanted, and that Umar ibn Sa'd basically, uh, excuse me, that Ibn Ziyad said that, and of course we'll never allow that. Okay. But we see that this was how Muslim saw him. And this was not just Muslim. As we'll see as we move to Karbala. We all know this whole story of him being promised the rulership of Ray, which is current day Tehran. If you go in Tehran where Shah Abdul Azim, Abdul Azim al Hassani is buried, his great companion of the Ahl Bayt, that area is what was considered Ray at that time. Now, what we often hear is that he was promised Ray in, in exchange for being. Um, you know, involved in the battle of Karbala. But in truth, what happened was that he was given the letter that said, hey, you are in charge of Ray. Just go there and give this with a stamp from Yazid and Ibn Ziyad, and you've got Ray. And he was actually sent to Ray. And he started off towards Ray with 4,000 soldiers. And along the way, we see that Ibn Ziyad sends a messenger and says, hey, Hur has stopped Abu Abdullah in so and so place, you need to go and handle this matter. Take care of this matter if you want to stay in that position that I had promised you. And you see here, when we look at the history, that the whole feeling, you, you can like see Umar ibn Asad's feelings coming out onto the paper, that he's not happy about this. He says, I was trying to avoid this. Okay? And now we start to see, brothers and sisters, the internal battle that's going on. You remember how Hur was on that day when he said, I'm looking at myself between heaven and hell. We start to see a glimpse of the same thing with Umar ibn Sa'd. So what happens is that when he reaches Karbala, he sends a messenger to Abu Abdullah. He says, what's the situation? What do you want? Why are you here? Abu Abdullah sends the following message back. He says, we were invited here by the people of Kufa. It seems that we're no longer welcome here. And so we would like to return to Medina. And because of your close kinship to us, we expect that from you. That you will allow us to return to Medina, to return to our homes. We haven't committed any crime. Here you see that Umar ibn Sa'd was almost thrilled. He said, Alhamdulillah, I am going to accomplish my goal of handling this situation, of ending whatever movement against the government, the central government that Abu Abdullah was trying to 
partake in, and at the same time, I'll be on my way without having to engage in any sort of battle. And so he sends a letter back to Ibn Ziyad. And it seems as though Ibn Ziyad was almost ready to accept this suggestion of Umar ibn Sa'd, that we allow Hussein to go back. But, brothers and sisters, here we see that the next individual who we'll be talking about in a few minutes comes into the story. And that was Shemr. Shemr seems to be the one who convinces Ibn Ziyad that this is a bad idea. He says that if you allow Hussein to get back to Medina, you'll never get another chance at him. Okay, he's, he's going to be able to raise another army against us. And so he, Shimr is sent to Karbala on the 9th with this letter. And the letter says the following. It says, Umar ibn Sa'd, either you kill Abu Abdullah al Hussein, or you give over, if you're not for this task, you give over the rulership of your army, you give over the command of your army to Shimr, who I've sent here. And Shimr was basically after power, as we'll see. And here we see what Umar ibn Sa'd says. He says to Shimr, he says, what have you done? May God destroy your household. And he actually used like a swear word here as well. Okay? He was very upset. He said, you dissuaded Ibn Ziyad from accepting what I had written. See, we're starting to see that internal conflict, even from someone like, like Umar ibn Sa'd. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali. Now one of the things that allowed Shemr to convince Ibn Ziyad that this was a bad idea or that Umar ibn Sa'd might not be up to the task was that he said, I've heard that Umar ibn Sa'd is going in the night and meeting with Imam Hussein and speaking with Imam Hussein. He's like, how can you trust him? Send me. Allow me to go and make sure that this job gets done. And there was truth to that. Because we see that Imam Hussein, at least on one occasion, he met with Umar ibn Sa'd before Shimr had arrived. And according to the historians, what happened was that they went and they met in a place between the two camps. You can't say two armies because Ya Abu Abdullah. Yeah. Between the two camps, and we see that they went with around 20 people. Both sides had around 20 people. When they get close to each other, Imam Hussein says, only Hazrat Abbas and Ali al-Akbar should come with me. And from Umar ibn Sa'd's side comes, he comes with his son and one other individual. And when they meet, Imam Hussein says the following to this individual who he's known since his childhood, who he's known his father his whole life. Right? He says, Atuqatiluni wa ana ibn man alimt? He says, You're gonna fight me? You're gonna try to kill me? You're gonna try to fight me? When you know I'm the son of, you know who I'm the son of. Whether he's referring to Amir al Mumin or referring to Rasulullah, you can see he was trying to play with the heart, play to the heart of Umar ibn Sa'd. Whatever was left there, they say, Come on, what are you doing here? And then, brothers and sisters, there's a key point here that we can learn a lot from. And we'll move into the lessons shortly. Where he says, He says, leave these people. Come with me, be with me. Oh, he says, because this is better for you. This will be a better way or closer for you in reaching proximity to Allah and getting close to Allah to be with me, Hussein. That's what's better for you. 
What does he respond? He says, they will destroy my house. Imam Hussein says, I'll get you a new house. He says, they will take my wealth. Imam Hussein says, I will give you money from my money in Medina. He says, they will kill my family. Here Imam Hussein says nothing. He leaves the tent. He tells him those famous words that you will never taste, you know, the wheat of Ray or whatever it was, the water of Ray, whatever it was. See, brothers and sisters, this call of Abu Abdullah al Hussein is the same call that our Imam is making to us. The same call that every Imam made to his people, that every Prophet made to his people. That be with me, it's better for you. It's better for you to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if we have the mindset of a Umar ibn Sa'ad and we say, well, what about my house? Well, what about my job? Well, what about my family? At the end, the Imam has nothing left to say other than to walk away. Because we are no longer on the same wavelength. We're no longer on the same page, in the same book. We've lost that Tawhidi worldview if we're thinking like a Umar ibn Sa'ad. When the Imam is calling us, this is what he's calling to. It may be through hardship. It may be through sacrifice. It may be through us being assassinated out here like we're seeing happening in New Mexico. Whatever it is. But we're not going to back down. Because what the Imam is calling us to is something greater. He's not calling us to having a better house and a comfortable life. He's calling us to proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's calling us to paradise. This is the call that is Karbala. This is the call that is Ashura. This is the call that is the Imam of our time. Send me a salawat ala Muhammad. Oh, But Umar ibn Sa'd, he makes his decision. And there's some poetry, I'm just read one line. It's very telling. He says, he's talking about, should I kill Imam Hussein or should I take the government of Ray? And he says about killing Hussein, he says, Fafihi, Fafi qatlahi annar. Very clearly he says, there's hellfire if I kill him. I know that. He knows what he's doing. See? As you get higher in ma'rifah, closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you understand who Allah is, the more you know what you're doing. Your salah improves. You have you have you understand who you're in front of as you get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you recognize the presence of the Imam of our time in the majlis of Abu al-Fadl Abbas, your ma'rifah is going up. You're seeing him. The same is true with the inverse. There's an inverse triangle. As you get closer to being like shaitan, the more you know what you're doing. You see, what did they say? What are we going to talk about tomorrow in the maqtab? We're killing you, we know who you are and we're killing you. He knew he was going to go to hellfire for this. Hazrat Hur, when he sees what's going to happen, the war is about to start. You see, this is that crucial moment. They're both there. This is you and I. These are our spiritual destinies. We all have a choice. Hur or Umar ibn Sa'ad. We're both standing there. We both know very clearly. On one side is paradise, and one side is hellfire. On one side is arrows and spears. On one side is comfort. We have to make the choice. What did Hur say? He said, by God, I will not accept anything but paradise. He looks, before he says this, he looks to Umar ibn Sa'ad. He said, are you really going to fight this man? He couldn't believe what was going to happen. What does Umar ibn Sa'ad say? He says the least of it will be that heads roll and arms are chopped off. He knew exactly what was going to happen. And you see, when you have that negative ma'rifah, that ma'rifah of the evil, you will go to the farthest length. You will be the first to shoot the arrow. You will make sure that even when the war is over and you've accomplished what you needed to accomplish to get the government of Ray, that you still say, where are ten horsemen? 
I need ten horsemen. Nobody asked him to do that. What is the end of this cursed person? Cursed at the lips of the infallibles. Cursed at the lips of the imam of the time. He doesn't even get, brothers and sisters, the government of Ray. Once the people see what has happened in Karbala, in Bibi Zainab, and uh, in Imam Sajjad, they begin the movement that is Azadari, that we're continuing here tonight. We see that they started, a blame game started. Okay, well, who was responsible for this massacre? Not me. No, it was Ibn Ziyad. No, no, not Ibn Ziyad. Not me, it was Umar ibn Sa'd. See, you couldn't reward him now. If you rewarded him, now you're taking the blood of Hussein on your hands. So they said, no, no, you're not getting right. And it wasn't, it, it, when he was coming back from Karbala, he started to understand what had happened. Some say because of the things that he was seeing and hearing. Some say because of this political angle that I mentioned. And there was an individual, an old friend of his, who passed by him. Now, as he's returning from Karbala. And he says, Oh, Umar ibn Sa'd, how are you doing? What's going on? How are you feeling? Umar ibn Sa'd responds, he says, don't ask. He says, no man has ever been as miserable as I am right now. No man has ever returned to his home in a worse condition than I am right now. He said, I killed the family of the Holy Prophet and I've committed a great sin. See, but remember what we said, that Ayatul Jawadi said, about certain sins, about certain doors being closed for us, that we never know when that it happens, brothers and sisters. Right? It's not so easy to come back from a sin like this, even if you know it's a sin. How long did this last? He sold it all. He gave it all up for Ray, which he never even got to. How long did it last? Five years, six years. Mukhtar comes, he's killed in his bed. Five years, six years. All right, this is, these are our decisions, brothers and sisters. For maybe it'll be 50 years of happiness. We enjoy this dunya. But for what? So that on the day of resurrection, we are with the Umar ibn Sa'ds. We are with the Shims. We're with the Ibn Ziyads. Where we can't smell the Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Is it worth it for you and I to continue to sin? I'm speaking to myself first and foremost. Send me a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Just one sentence on the lesson or why he fell. This hadith of the Holy Prophet, Hubba dunya ra'sa kulla khatiya. That the love of this world is the source or the pinnacle or the reason for all of the slips. And we've spoken about this at length. That for someone, it might be ray. For someone else, it might be the car. For someone else, it might be the job. For someone else, it might be the opposite gender. Whatever it is. For someone else, it might be the big crowd. Whatever it is. It's all hubba dunya, brothers and sisters. This is what we have to train ourselves. And it comes from making the right decisions every day. If we can make those right decisions when we're alone in the car, what are we listening to? When we're alone with our phones, what are we looking at? When we're alone with our family, how are we treating them? You start to make those right decisions day by day, minute to minute, moment to moment. When the big challenge comes, when the big test comes, you'll, you'll find yourself like a whore. You'll find yourself ready to be with the imam of your time. So the next individual and the last individual that we will be talking about in the fall of the elite is Shimr, the son of the Joshan. Now, brothers and sisters, just to give you all a heads up, so tomorrow we're going to have the maktal. And the day after, when I speak here in the night, we are going to be talking about how to avoid the fall. You know, alhamdulillah, we've been able to, inshallah, gain the lessons from all of these stories. But sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming. You're like, man, these guys were like literally seeing the Holy Prophet, literally living in a Muslim country. Surrounded by the Holy Quran, surrounding by you know masajid and prayers and all of this, and they still fell. Like, what chance do I have? Sometimes it's a daunting task. We know how difficult it is 
growing up here, going to high school, going to college, going to work. Okay, we've all been there. So what we're going to focus on on that night is some practical tips. And I would say that if you found any of what's been said here beneficial, then please definitely make sure to join us on that night so that we leave here with our pockets full, with our tool belt full to be able to combat you know, these challenges that we're facing. Send me a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala so the Joshan, that means the owner of a shield. His father was known as someone who had like an armor. And according to some, he was one of the first who had that type of an armor. And so that's why he became known as that. Now what we know about Shimr was that he accepted Islam around the time of the victory of Mecca, Fatih Mecca. Okay? And that he was a supporter of Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, in the Battle of Safin. And because we're talking about the elite, we have to understand that, okay, he may not have been a commander, but he also wasn't a nobody in that battle. He went up against some of the great champions of Muawiyah's camp. And he earned his stripes. He actually had some scars on his face. He had like some sort of medical condition as well. But some of the scars that he had on his face were from the Battle of Safin defending Amir al-Mu'mini. He wasn't an unknown person. As we'll see tomorrow, when he first shows up on the scene speaking to Abu Abdullah, Imam Hussein recognizes his voice and says, Is that you, Shem? Where'd you come from? You, you, went, you haven't been here. He showed up on the 9th of Muharram. Okay. Now this is where it, can get, it gets a little bit scary. Okay. And remember we talked about that, that inverse triangle. That ma'rafa goes up from a negative perspective. They understand more. Okay. Shaitan understands very well who Allah is. Yeah, he worshipped him for 6,000 years. He knows who the Holy Prophet is. He knows who the Imam of the time is. He knows who you are. Okay? What did he do after this battle of Safin that he was almost martyred in? He almost, Shimmer almost became one of the shahada in the battle of Safin. He was injured. He had to recover. Okay? He went to Kufa. He didn't join, to at least, at least from my research, he didn't join the battle of Nahrawan. He went to Kufa and became what? He became like a mufti. Became like a scholar, like a well-known scholar. People would come to him. He would narrate to them traditions that his father heard from the Holy Prophet or that other people heard from the Holy Prophet. This is how he was known as a knowledgeable person in the city of Kufa. This was Shem. You don't believe me. It's difficult to, to fathom. What if I said he walked to Hajj? This was the type of person he was. What if I say he walked to Hajj two times? What if I told you that Shem walked to Hajj 16 times? That the same mark on the forehead of Abu al-Fadl Abbas that they said that they saw on the spear, when they see his head, they saw the mark of sujood. They said Shem had a mark of sujood on his forehead. What happened? How does it happen? Just like we've been talking about, right? So we talked about who he was a little bit, what he did. We're going to get into that later. But first, let's get to, to the lessons. Why he fell. And sisters, at this point, I'm just repeating myself. It's not rocket science, right? dunya. And it doesn't happen overnight. This is, if you take one thing away from these lessons, this is what it is. It's that the love of this world, it comes into our hearts one thing at a time, one material possession at a time, one position at a time, whatever it is at a time. And slowly, 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 we're no longer that person who walked to Hajj 16 times. Now we're the person sitting on the chest of an imam. This is how it happens. We see he was involved with that same issue of Hajj bin Adi. 
testifying against him wrongfully. It's not a small thing, brothers and sisters. We've talked about how Shimmer, what role he played a little bit already, how he convinced Ibn Ziyad, and how in Karbala he was recognized. When he started to speak against Imam Hussein, we see that Habib said something that was very telling. He said that, Shimmer, you say that you don't understand what Abu Abdullah is saying, and there's truth in that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sealed your heart. See, it was too late for him at that point. I'll leave you with this last point about Shimmer, and we'll move on to the Musiba, brothers and sisters. In one of the books of Shamsuddin al Dhahabi, who was a student of Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Taymiyyah, he was not from our school. He mentions the following. He says that it's in a discussion about if we see a hadith and Shimmer's name comes, that it's related by Shimmer, can we accept this as a trustable source or not? And the scholar, Dhahabi, he says, no, we don't. Why? Because he's a killer of uh, Sayyidi Shabab Ahl Jannah. Right? This is in the books of Ahl Sunnah. So we wouldn't accept this. And then he mentions this story. He says that after Karbala, Shim was in the congregational prayer. And after the congregational prayer, he starts to ask God for forgiveness. He says, Fuck fairly. He says, oh Allah, forgive me. It says that the individual next to him starts to almost laugh and say, You're asking God for forgiveness. You're the killer of the son of the Messenger of Allah. Who are you kidding? And Shimmer's response here is very, it's a good lesson for us living here in the United States. He says, in my own words, he says, I was just doing my job. The individual says, you can only say you're just doing your job when it comes to things that are khair. When it's one of the things that are bad, you can't just say, I'm just doing my job and do your job. Right? And sisters, we got to be careful where we're getting our risk from, our sustenance from. This is another important point we learn from Karbala. When Imam Hussein was speaking to the enemies, he said, some of the reason that you're doing this is because of the haram food in your bellies. He wasn't talking about pork, necessarily. He's talking about the fact that where they get the in income from was problematic. So this was Shem. And these are the lessons we take from Karbala. But brothers and sisters, tonight we're going to remember someone who was martyred on those plains of Karbala, but there were some unique characteristics that he had. He didn't have a battle cry like the other shahada. He didn't come to the battlefield with armor even. He didn't come with a weapon by his side. But he came thirsty. But he couldn't complain of his own thirst. This was the baby of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, Abdullah Radi, or as we may know him as Ali Asghar. Brothers and sisters, I was once in a majlis in Qom when I was sitting next to a man. We had a small child. He put his child on the floor. The child was sleeping, maybe a few months old. And another brother walked by and mistakenly stepped on this child. The father began to hit his head. He was checking on his child, alhamdulillah, the child was okay. But he began to cry uncontrollably, I'll never forget. 
This is natural, brothers and sisters, for all of us. I have a daughter here tonight. She's four months old. This morning, we saw that she scratched herself. She has a scratch on her nose. And me and my wife were upset at ourselves this morning. We said it was our fault. A small scratch that she does to herself. We should have cut her nails earlier. This is how we feel when we see these children, these innocent masoom children. Brothers and sisters, I was once with a brother. His child was missing. We had to go to the police station. When we got to the police station, the police took me aside. And they said to me, they said, this child is not missing. We found the child and it's passed away. It's been killed. And they said to me that we would like you to be there when we say this to your friend. I started to say to myself, Ya Allah, this is a difficult moment for me, but more so for this friend. And I'll never forget, brothers and sisters, that when they told him of what had happened, he said, Ya Hussein, what did Abu Abdullah go through that day? That no matter how bad we have it, no matter how difficult a uh, situation we find ourselves in, we can say, Ya Hussein, when we know that we will get through it. On that night, Imam Hussein, on a night like tonight, the night, the Shab of Ashura, we see that everyone was with their children. They were saying goodbye to the warriors. They knew what the next day held. Layla was with Ali Akbar. Zainab was with Aun and Muhammad. Everyone was with their child. But I wonder, was Rabab with her child that night, saying her goodbyes? There was no one left except for the women. There was no one left except for the children, the women, and Imam Sajjad. When Imam Hussein crawls out, calls out, Hal min dabin? يَضُبُّ عَنْ حَرَمِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ حَلْ مِنْ مَوَحِدٍ يَخَافُ اللَّهِ فِينَا Is there any Muslim out there who can answer our call, who fears Allah in regards to us? حَلْ مِنْ مُغِيثٍ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ فِي أَغَاثَتِنَا Is there anyone who will help us? They say that at that moment, he heard the cry of a baby, his son Ali. He goes towards the tent. He wanted to say his goodbyes. He said, bring me my son. Here, brothers and sisters, some of the reports say that he called out to Zainab. He said, Zainab, bring me my son, some of the reports say. You say, why did he say Zainab? Why didn't he call his wife? Some say that at that point, Ali Asghar had become so thirsty that one person could no longer manage to take care of him. It was too difficult. The tears, the cries, so they were passing the baby from one mother to another. Some say that no, Imam Hussein couldn't 
see his wife, knowing the situation, knowing how the child was thirsty. So they brought him Ali. Imam Hussein saw the thirst. Some say that he decided to take the baby to try to see if he could at least get a little bit of water. Some say that it was Zainab who asked him to do so. As he left the tent with the baby, he took some of his clothing and put it over the head of the child. Ya Abdullah. He wanted to protect the child from the sun. <laughs> but who would protect the child from what was to come? He said to them, Ya qawm, qad qataltum akhi wa awladi wa ansari wa ma baqiya ghayruhu hadha al-tif. He said, you've killed my family, you've killed my children, you've killed my companions. None is left except for this innocent child. Do you see how he is flopping from thirst? Min dhambin, without any sin. In lam tarhamuni farhamu hadha tafl al if you have no mercy on me, have mercy on this innocent child. <laughs> what was the response, brothers and sisters? The response was from Harmala. <laughs> Before Abu Abdullah could even complete his sentence, وَبَيْنَمَا هُوَ كَذَلِكَ إِذْ أَتَاحُ سَحْمٌ the three-pointed arrow came towards Abu Abdullah. Has there ever been an arrow more painful than the one that pierces the neck of a six-month-old child and goes into the body of an infallible imam? فَذَبَحَ <laughs> الْتِفْلِ مِنَ الْأُذْنِ إِلَىٰ <laughs> the baby's neck was cut from ear to ear. I saw the neck of my daughter's ear today, brothers and sisters. It is less than one finger. <laughs> it says that the baby's body continued to move <laughs> in the arms of the imam. <laughs> the imam put his hand over the blood that was coming from the neck of Ali Azhar. Whatever was left of the neck of Ali Azhar. <laughs> and he threw it into the sky. And none of it fell down. And they say that he heard a cry from the heavens saying, let him go, Ya Hussein. Because there is someone to feed him in the heavens. <laughs> Some say that Abu Abdullah, he began walking back and forth. Was he thinking about how he would face the mother of this child? Was he thinking of how he would talk to Sakina? She waited to see her brother. They say that he decided to bury the child. He took out his sword. He began to bury the child. But I say, Ya Hussein, <laughs> did you leave a mark? Because they say that the child didn't remain buried on the night of Ashura. <laughs> and some say that they saw the head again on the tips of the spear. <laughs> but 
لعنة الله على قوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي من قلب ينقلبون بك يا الله 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 بمحمد بعلي بفاتمة بالحسن بالحسين بذرية الحسين Oh Allah, we ask you for the sake of the pure blood of Ali and Al-Asghar to forgive our sins, to forgive our parents, to forgive anyone who's taught us a word in Islam. Oh Allah, we ask you for the sake of the blood of Abu Abdullah al Hussein to keep us on the straight path, to keep our children on the straight path until our last breaths. Oh Allah, we ask you for the sake of Fatima al-Zahra to hasten the reappearance of the Imam and to make us his helpers when he comes. وَآخِرَ الدَّعْوَانَ عَلَيْنَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ رَحْمَةُ اللَّ